Hello, lovelies. You're listening to episode 57 of the Broken Enchantments podcast, written and read by Elizabeth Wheatley. That's me. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Be sure to check out my Patreon for next week's episode, now available. You can check out the links below. Happy listening! The rest of the day seemed dead. There was not much to do besides wait and watch. That evening, after the Slavish had finished marching out and Volmachen was again sealed off from the world, the mood changed from boredom to excitement. No sooner had Janir entered the banquet hall with her guards and Damilla than she could sense the festive air. Revelry was the order of the evening. The main course had been another large boar, and while it was bursting with sweet, musky taste, it was as tough as morsain hide. Janir worked a piece of trapped meat from between her teeth as the chatter of conversation went on throughout the room. She was ravenously hungry, not having eaten all day, and cleaned two servings of boar and a half loaf of bread off her plate. Cerulius and Amilla were speaking with several other Argotolums she didn't know. The mood in the banquet hall was only a few degrees from celebratory, as people joked and laughed louder than usual. The warm air and the pleasant atmosphere were like a lullaby, and Janir curled her arms beneath her head like a pillow. With her face buried in her arms, the warmth of the hall at her back, Janir relaxed. A deep yawn filled her chest. She had battled with so many doubts and conclusions these past hours. It was overwhelming. She sank into a light doze, still aware of the chatter around her but apart from it. Servants cleared away the plates and emptied goblets. A large log in the hearth gave off a pop as it exploded in a rain of embers. Amilla's laugh rang above several others, clear and distinct, like a bell chime. Brevia would be under attack any hour, perhaps even already. People would be dying, suffering. Janir felt as if a landslide were tumbling down on her, and she had no idea how to escape it. Helpless to stop it. But she could stop it. Velasquez's words nagged unwanted and frightening in the back of her mind. Tired? Canistrith stood over her like a mother hen inspecting a wayward chick. I'm sorry, Janir mumbled. We had no idea where you had gone, or if something had happened to you. What were you doing? Canistrith demanded, sitting down beside her niece. Running off twice. I'm sorry, I I just had to get out. Janir weakly explained. Lucan told me that's what you said when he found you, but you wouldn't tell him why. The fact that Lucan had repeated their conversation to Canistrith made Janir feel betrayed, manipulated. She wondered if Lucan had volunteered the information, or if Canistrith had asked. So, why? Canistrith prodded. Why are you acting like this? What could Janir tell her? The truth? That she knew they had all lied to her? that the very thought of Seovan's torment tore at her like the fangs of a rabid animal? I'm confused. Afraid. Of what, Janir? Canistrith went tense, gripping her arm. I can't explain it, Janir whispered. I can't tell. I can't. Janir, tell me now. Canistrith's fingers dug into Janir's wrist. She wasn't rough, but the threat was there. The girl ripped her hand free. Stay away from me. She stumbled off the bench, jerking free of her aunt. Just leave me alone. 
Junior hadn't realized she'd screamed until a shocked silence overcame the hall and surprised faces turned in her direction. Humiliation and confusion flushed her with heat. Junior shielded her face from her father as she ran, fleeing back to her room. It was too cold to be in the stables, and she couldn't think of where else to go. Janir crashed into her room, slamming the door. Canistrith shouted and ran after her, throwing the door open the next instant. Janir, what was that about? Canistrith stormed into the room, kicking the door open. Turning her back, Janir held up a hand to stop Canistrith. Leave me alone, she whispered. Please. The moon had shown itself. The Slavish would have enough light for their trek to Brevia. They'd been marching for the better part of a day, and without the need for rest or food, they could be in Laris already. Jinir, that outburst was... A dark presence filled the threshold, flaring into Jinir's awareness. Canistra, that's enough. My lord. The Lord Argotalum's voice dropped. She is not some drudge dragged off a slave cart. She is a Mortana, and the heir of Argotolum. Canistrith made to protest, but the door slammed, shutting her on the other side. Junair. Her father approached carefully, as one might a wild animal. Junair, what's wrong? I don't know. Janir smeared a hand over her face. Father, I don't know. Do you know why you were so hostile with your aunt? He asked cautiously. Janir locked her arms across her chest and faced her father. Is she listening? The Lord Argotolum shook his head. Not if we speak quietly. All right, I... It might sound insane but Janir couldn't ignore the truth, what she had seen. Father, I think she helped. What? I think Canistrith helped the traitors. What? I get these headaches. Like I have needles stabbing into my skull. I think they are set off by things the people who took me didn't want me to remember. The Lord Argotalum nodded. I've noticed. Canistra gives me those headaches more than anyone. Junair. Father, I know you lied to me. The Lord Argotalum went quiet. It's all right. She looked away, remembering Lucan's words. I think you meant it well. If she couldn't trust the brother who had saved her life, who could she trust? Her suspicion tried to rise against her father, but what would he have to gain by breaking her mind? She plowed on before she could answer her own question. I'll trust you meant it for the best. I don't know who did this to me, but I know Canistrith had a hand in it. I... I know! Janir's father clenched and unclenched his jaw, contemplatively. Why did you not come to me with this sooner? You've clearly given it a great deal of thought. I'm sorry, I just... I know it sounds mad. But there's her evasion and how angry she gets whenever I question her. Like, she expects me to obey. And how afraid I was of her when I first awoke. The Lord Argotalum took a deep breath, drawing out the moment he would have to answer. Your aunt has shown me nothing but loyalty since we were children. I'm sorry, Chenier meekly replied. I want another explanation, I do, but I can't find one. And what of your lying to me? What happened last night when you disappeared? The Lord Argotalum straightened, cocking his head to one side as if in challenge. Inside. Guilt and shame warred with suspicion and fear. She couldn't tell him. Couldn't. She wondered if he had ordered the entire mountainside searched. That there had been no reports of captures gave her hope that Carisle and the elves were safe. 
After a time, the Lord Argatolum let off a slow exhale, rubbing the back of his neck, not unlike Lucan. Let me pursue this matter. Do you understand? Yes, father. Will you return to the celebration? Janir hesitated. If I ask Canistrith to let you alone. Pushing herself reluctantly off the bed, Janir didn't feel she had much choice. He was being more than reasonable, not pushing her, even though she was hiding something. All right. She re-emerged with her father, avoiding Canistrith's gaze as she did. The Lord Argatolum's attendants said nothing, but embarrassment flared through her. Canistrith opened her mouth, but her father shook his head. Not now, sister. With a hand on her shoulder, the Lord Argatolum tugged Janir after him, in the direction of the banquet. Pushing her hair back, Janir cleared her throat. She shouldn't have run out like that. People would be staring. There would be questions. She was growing so tired of making mistakes and, worse, not knowing why her feelings reacted as they did. Rounding the corner ahead of her father, she nearly ran into an armored figure. Lucan. She jerked to a halt to avoid a collision. My lady sister. Lucan inclined his head stiffly, then bowed much deeper to the Lord Argatolum. Lord father? Are you going to the feast? No. Lucan glanced over the honor guards at the Lord Argatolum's sides. I am overseeing watch detail tonight. I just saw you run out and... He cleared his throat. I should get to my Argatolums. Janair had been tasked with no such responsibilities, but then again she wasn't in the most stable or predictable of mental states at the moment. You should. There was nothing to indicate one way or another how the Lord Argatolum meant that. Regardless, Lucan bowed again as if in apology. Good evening. Without another word, he marched past, and Janir was left feeling she had said something wrong. The Lord Argatolum quickly found Cerulius and Canicade with Amilla near the blazing hearth. A few words passed between them, and Cerulius bowed before gesturing to a place beside him. The Lord Argatolum nodded, and saw her settled before taking a glowering canistrith aside. Amilla frowned as her mother marched away, hissing quietly at the Lord Argatolum. Janir was just grateful that her cousin didn't ask any questions. The next half-hour of the evening passed in a blur. People laughed. Wine disappeared, permitted for the first time since their arrival. A few kisses were stolen. Even the fire's loud crackling seemed to be celebrating with the Argatolums. Across the room, Janir's father actually laughed. But even here there was something grave about him, something so sober that no amount of strong drink could quell it. Janir doubted her father would allow himself to get drunk, he valued the use of his mind too much. At Janir's side, Canicade had no such reservations. He'd already finished off three goblets in an hour, and was beyond caring. Amilla spoke to Cerulius over the whistling chorus of a flute, a lyre, and a pair of drums that a trio of Argatolums had started playing. There were a few couples twirling to one side, dancing Argatolum dances Janir couldn't follow, Shouldn't they have been at least a little familiar? At hearing her name, Janir snapped out of her grim reverie and turned to Amilla. What was that? I was telling Cerulius that he should dance with you. And I was telling her no, Cerulius replied. I stand with the Morton on this one, Janir agreed. Her mind was drawn again to Brevia. What right did she have to play when lives could be lost at any moment? Lives would be lost no matter what she did, no matter what she chose. That thought was torturous. I stand with the Mortana, Canicade countered. Cerulius soaked a corner of bread in the meat juices on his plate. 
Which one? Canicade rolled his eyes. Dance with the girl, Cerulius. It's called living, and you need to do more of it. With that, Canicade returned to nursing his fourth drink. I'd nominate you if you were sober enough to stand, Cerulius quipped, polishing off the last of his meal. Oh, come on, Amilla persisted. Janair, I can't drag him out there. She motioned to her bandaged leg. So you'll have to do it. Why? Because it'll do you too good. You could both use some lightning up. Now go. Amilla grabbed Cerulius and playfully shoved him off the bench. Canicade propelled Janir after Cerulius, shooing them both toward the group of twirling couples. He laughed, toasting them with his depleted drink. Go on! Amilla made a shooing motion and leaned back against the table on her elbows with a smirk, practically daring them to dance. How many have you had? Janir motioned to Amilla's silver goblet. Amilla giggled. This is my second. Believe me, I'd dance with him myself if it weren't for this. She gestured to her bandaged leg again. But that means you have to dance with him for me. Now get on with it. Don't worry, Cerulius murmured to Janir, staring pointedly at Amilla. We'll get her for this. He snatched up Amilla's goblet and downed the remaining liquor. Cerulius drew a deep breath. Dance with me, milady. Janir hesitated. What changed your mind? Do you know how often an honor guard can publicly dance with his charge? He leaned over, dropping his voice. I had to protest a little. I have a reputation to uphold. Janir couldn't help thinking how different this was from the Cerulius she knew. But she nodded, and let him lead her to the improvised dance floor. I have no idea how this works, she whispered, slipping her hand into Cerulius's. Cerulius gave her a wry smile. Watch your toes. Janir let Cerulius place a hand on the small of her back, while the other held one of hers and allowed him to lead as they floated around in a circle. She concentrated, making every effort to keep up and not look ridiculous. They were so close together. Janir wasn't sure how she felt about it. With anyone else, she would have been uncomfortable, but Cerulius? She trusted him. Before they had even truly begun, the song came to an end, and the music stopped. There was a brief pause as the musicians debated what to play next, and then the three instruments were strumming, whistling, and beating away again to a quick, lively tune that leapt and bubbled like a fountain. Very well. Let's see how this goes. Without another word, Cerulius swept her up into the rhythm, spinning her away from him to pull her back again. They swayed, stomped, and swirled to the song's snapping beat. Gleefully, people laughed, and Janir laughed with them, the euphoria infectious. Cerulius beamed down at her, and she wondered how much of his smile came from Amilla's wine. Janir was soon too busy enjoying herself to pay attention to anyone else. Cerulius was a splendid dancer, at least good enough that Janir found it almost effortless to follow. It was as if they were the only people in the room. Everyone else became just moving shadows. She lost herself in the dance, in the swaying, snapping motions as Cerulius guided her. Cerulius put his hands on her waist and lifted her off the ground. Janir giggled as he spun her around once, the music cutting off just as she came back to the floor. He had timed it perfectly. He must know the song. The black welt above Cerulius's left eye, and the scar beneath that. It looked unsightly at first. But now that Janir had gotten to know the person underneath, after all these weeks, when she learned to see past his battered face, she didn't mind the scars at all. Now he was grinning down at her, looking young and... Janir drew a sharp breath. 
It was a good thing she hadn't had any wine or else she might have kissed him. And her kisses were being saved for someone else. The music started again. A different song. This one only a little less lively. Cerulius looked past her to the other dancers. One more? Janir couldn't help herself. Of course. But the next dance wasn't nearly as enjoyable as the last. Janir kept thinking. There was someone else. Someone she was waiting for. Someone who should have been twirling her in his arms right then. Someone she was saving her kisses for. She couldn't have said how she knew or why, but the answer came plain as the beat of her racing heart. It was Saovan. You have been listening to Broken Enchantments, written and read by Elizabeth Wheatley. Don't forget to check out my Patreon for early access to episodes, bonus content, and lots of patrons-only freebies. You can learn more at elizabethwheatley.com. And don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or YouTube. I'll see you next time.